Well, we're a minute early, but what the hell, let's go ahead and get started. Um, let me just, uh, hello everybody, welcome to NASA headquarters. Um, you are here for the Sustainable Land Imaging Architecture Study Industry and Partner Day, and thank you for coming. We really appreciate your presence here. Um, I'm, I'm Stephen Voltz, the Associate Director for Flight Programs in Earth Science, and I'm just going to give the intro and, the com and the set the stage and then let our speakers um, present pers various aspects of what we're doing here, and there'll be an extensive period for Q&A, which is one of the primary reasons to have all of you here today. So again, welcome. For, thank you for coming. Um, this is really coming on the heels of the successful launch and recent commissioning of the Landsat 8 LDCM mission. This is, a, this is really a, a critical time. It's a great time, ready to sort of excited now to proceed to the next step in, in continuing the long data history um, that Landsat's had since the early 70s to, to the present day. So this is a great time for us. In, in, the, in the present submittal to the Congress in 2013 um, for the 2014 budget, the U.S. Budge, the U.S. government is committing for the first time. Well, I, actually, I've learned not to say the first time because there's always some in the audience who's been doing this for 40 years and said, you know, we did this several other times. But for the first time in recent history, at least, um, to actually developing a sustained land imaging program for the next 20 odd years, um, from 20 years post the LDCM Landsat 8 Life you know, Prime Mission, which is 2018. So this is a this is a really a seminal decision, direction from the president, and a critical moment for the for the land imaging program because for the for this period now we have the opportunity to define a, a long-term program which is sustainable and predictable and reliable, um, rather than the ad hoc solutions which have been very successful in producing a great data record but have always been a little bit on the hairy edge of what happens if something doesn't work out just right. So our task here is really to establish, we have a mandate from the president along with the budget to do it, to establish a firm foundation for the future of the global moderate resolution multispectral data record along with the imaging acquisition, the data processing, and the, and the free and open data dissemination to the, unit, to the community. So really that's, that's the spectrum, the scope of what we're trying to address here. And it's really a great opportunity. Now with this, NASA and the USGS are going to be working together, first to study and then to implement this program. So NASA brings to the table its systems engineering expertise, its program and project management expertise in flight systems acquisition and development, its flight hardware expertise. The USGS, on their side, brings together a long record of land imaging, monitoring, data, data processing, data dissemination and distribution, and extensive knowledge of the user community. Together, we've had, NASA and USGS have had a successful partnership in the recent past, in the past, and this, and we both look forward to continuing that for the next 20, 25 years to continue this, the, the land imaging record into the future. So what's, what's the purpose of today's meeting? Today's meeting is really the, the first public step in this study activity, um, and by extension in the new land imaging program. So you'll hear from the panel, and particularly from Dave Jarrett at the end, about exactly how we're going to implement this, but this is the first step that we're coming out to the community here to get your ideas, to get involved in the overall community. The study effort is a coordinated activity, as I said, between NASA and the USGS, but it's also coordinated with all of the stakeholders. Industry, science, the user communities are all part of this program, are part of the use of it, so we want to have the, the, the study needs to include the ideas, the inputs from the, the extensive list of stakeholders that we have. Obviously, it's a U.S. government implementation, so NASA and the USGS will be developing these, taking your input and developing a program. We're going to do this in a collaborative and an open forum so that you guys, you and, and the community at large, get to see how we're doing and what we're doing and the decisions, the trades that we're making in the process. So it really do, we do want your ideas. The RFI is, that's going to be released today is one way to get it, but it's not the only way. We'll have a series of open interactive events that we will ask and solicit your input. You're welcome to, and we want to see that on a regular basis. So we don't want to do this in, in silence and then six months or a year from now come back with an answer and everybody said they don't know where it came from. We want to do this so everybody understands the process that we've used to do that. So ask questions, you know, open up your, you know, your, your um, open up our eyes to things that we may have missed and, and avoided or not seen in the process as we go through this. So with that, I'd like to just introduce um, the introductions of who we have today. Um, we have D David Redzanowski, who's the Chief of Staff from NASA, will give, the, will, will, will give a NASA presentation, followed by Peter Callahan from the Office of State Space and Technology Policy, from the Admin <laughs> Science, Science and Technology Policy. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. Uh, so there's other stuff, but space <laughs> is the most important part, <laughs> as long as you got that straight, okay? <laughs> this is, yeah, right. NSF can say something different. Um, Sarah Riker from our USGS will give the USGS side and presentation. 
And Michael Freilich, my boss, the director of the Earth Science Division from the, where this implementation will take place, will lead. And we'll end, well, the final one is David Jarrett, who's the program executive in my organization, who is the lead at NASA headquarters for this study activity. We'll present the details of the RFI and the path forward for the next year. Um, so I won't take up any more of the time. I will, so here's the agenda, which you'll see multiple times. We ask that you hold your questions until the Q&A period, which we have, which is about an hour at the end, an hour and a half, whatever we need. Um, we will be taking questions online through this uh, email address, which you should have seen in your, uh, if, you've, if you've registered online, and we'll, we'll include those at the end as well. Um, so please, in, in general, if you, when you ask questions, name, give your name and affiliation so we have an idea of, of your context as we try and answer your questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to the first speaker, which is David, to talk from the NASA perspective. Thanks, Steve. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if it's cold in here, we, we do that on purpose uh, so that uh, we keep folks engaged. Um, I just want to welcome everybody. Uh, on behalf of uh, NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden, uh, we are attendance at, at this important event today. Uh, I want to thank our executive branch colleagues for being here uh, from OSTP or whatever. <laughs> and. Uh, and, and, and USGS, um, uh, these folks are, are, are key to us. Uh, have a long-term partnership in working uh, with folks on, on this issue. I, I don't have to tell anybody here that you know this has been an issue that we've had many iterations and many incarnations, and, and many different different agencies lead, be a partner going forward. But despite all that. We seem to have a very long-term, awesome uh, continuity of data that we've used all types of environments, from federal, from local, from state, agriculture, private industry. That's what counts, is the final result, that we actually get the data and we keep the continuity of the database going forward. So we as NASA, we have a long history of involvement in this, and uh, we, we continue to do. I personally have had involvement on in this from the congressional side in the early 90s, uh, from the OMB side working with OSTP in early uh, 2000 in that time frame. Um, so I actually have a personal commitment. Uh, I'm just not talking from a, from a NASA standpoint, which we are incredibly committed to this. I'm talking from a personal commitment that uh, the importance of this data continuity, and, and I'm really pleased that I'm here today uh, to spend some time with you all and welcome you. As Steve had mentioned, uh, the current incarnation, the uh, Landsat Data Continuity Mission, which some people call LDCM or LCDM, depending how fast they're speaking, um, it's been very successful. Uh, we've had a great uh, launch back earlier this year. Uh, everything went smoothly. We've turned it over to USGS, and uh, they've named it Landsat 8. Did it in the right order. That's, it's good. And uh, so here we are today. So what comes next? Uh, what is our plan for what coming next? What is our plan for ensuring the continuity of that long-term Landsat data record that I've been speaking about? Uh, so we, we na here at NASA, we, ha we have some expertise, uh, as Steve mentioned, as program management. Uh, we're very good at systems engineering. Uh, and I think that is why uh, the administration has tasked us, working with USGS, to develop a plan. And this isn't a plan to build a carbon copy of the last one. Uh, I just want to be clear. That may ultimately lead the plan, but the intention is to really reach out new ideas and how we can get out of this loop we've been in of what comes next and come up with a plan that's affordable, that's sustainable, and that can continue the data continuity for 20 plus years after Landsat 8. So you, we're here today to kick this off. Uh, we have our own ideas. Um, we have some very good ideas of how to go forward. But I have a feeling that you out there have also great ideas, and maybe even better ideas, probably better ideas. We need to work with you. And so we're going to work with you, uh, OSTP, USGS, to come up with our plan. Um, we're going to rely on 
USGS's capability in terms of its, its capability on the, the data record as well as the, the ground systems. And as we have done in the past, we are really going to try to come up with a plan to not have a, a gap in that data continuity. So I just want to thank folks for, from OSTP and USGS for being here today. But more importantly, I actually want to thank you all today for being here. Um, we are committed. We are committed to doing something here and getting it right. We are committed to giving the taxpayer the benefit that it needs. We are committed to doing things just a little bit differently this time so that we can actually maintain this data record for as low as cost possible to the taxpayer. Uh, we all know um, the constraints we're under in our budgets going forward. Uh, they're not going to get any better over the next couple of years, but we are committed regardless of what that budget is to maintain this, this data continuity of the Landsat system. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, industry, academia, our international partners, uh, other agencies, very much appreciate your input. We want your ideas. Please share them. Please ask questions today. And as Steve said, it doesn't stop today. Please interact with us. Continue to provide information. The RFI will be coming out. And um, please respond because we're all ears and listening. And uh, Steve, thank you for, uh, for putting this together and thanking everyone. And uh, uh, I'll be here for a little while to, to listen as much as I can. I appreciate it. Thank you. And now that you've had a preview of Sarah Riker's talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So you, yeah, you're, you can be real quick, Sarah. So now I'd like to introduce uh, <laughs> Peter Callahan, who, whose office needs no introduction. So. <laughs> So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, and, and to NASA for hosting us. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to be part of this very exciting moment in the history of uh, national land imaging. Um, you know, we, and, and I'm glad also to provide OSCP's perspective on this extraordinary opportunity that we have in front of us. Um, as we set out to develop the nation's 20-year sustained land imaging program. So this year, 2013, really is a banner year for land imaging, um, as you all know. First in February, basically a flawless launch of Landsat 8. Congratulations to NASA and to GS in the collaboration there. The launch into a near-perfect orbit, which we all are grateful for. You could sort of hear a collective cheer going up around the world uh, from land managers, water managers, urban planners, conservationists, all these user groups that are so fundamentally connected to Landsat and to the, the imagery and to the data and the, uh, and the, uh, um, the products that produ are produced by GS. The whole enterprise of land imaging has, uh, is, is, is very near and dear to, to many communities. Um, and I think that we essentially, you know, the United States really delivered uh, uh, on our ongoing commitment once again to a sta state-of-the-art system for land imaging in, in this year in, with the launch of Landsat 8. And the series of Landsat satellites really deserves its reputation for providing the world's exquisite baseline for moderate resolution, freely available land imaging data. Um, so the value of this data from the Landsat series really needs no review with this community here today. And OSTP has consistently recognized this value. And we have maintained the view for many years that Landsat class data is among the most vital Earth observation data streams provided by the nation. And the Landsat series itself is among the most important set of scientific instruments we have in space. So this is why the United States has made land imaging and, uh, uh, a, a new or a refreshed priority in the 2014 budget. And what we have committed to, we have asked NASA and USGS not just to collaborate on a new system to follow Landsat 8, but also with the development of a 20-year program for sustained land imaging. And this is important and historic. Um, 
it has been said that this is perhaps not the first time we've made this commitment, but it is the first time in a long time that it has appeared in the budget. And uh, after years of study and countless experiments, the variety of arrangements, we now have are proceeding towards this long sought after goal of the community. And Sarah Riker uh, remarked to me after, shortly after the launch of Landsat 8 that you know, how wonderful and how remarkable it was that USGS and NASA were already into a deep dialogue about the nation's next steps in land imaging from the launch viewing room of Landsat 8, which was such a, such a wonderful uh, thing to sort of to, to see and appreciate and to be planning for the future in that time. So it's wonderful that we have our eyes fixed on this new horizon in this area. And we are, we are clearly past the phase of wondering whether we will extend our land imaging efforts with a follow-on mission. The question is now not we will, but how will we? So, which brings us to the nitty gritty. And we've come, we've gathered here today to begin this conversation, intensifying our investigation into the future of land imaging. Because much is known and much has been written. Uh, but nevertheless, tough questions and challenges do remain. Among the most difficult of these is how to balance three things, the imperative for continuity of the measurement with the need to infuse new and emerging technologies into the next state-of-the-art system, and of course, the requirement that we achieve all of this within anticipated cost constraints. So the context of our changing climate leaves no doubt that we must maintain the land cover record so that we can accurately track the rapid pace of change and make sound decisions about the future and prepare for those pending changes as effectively as possible. And we must, this means we must ensure that the scientific integrity of, our, of any future system is compatible with the long-term data record. We also, uh, um, among the many other areas in which, many areas in which Landsat continuity is, has proven crucial, uh, I'll note that our knowledge of evapotranspiration and water resource management in the Western United States has, uh, has been uh, substantially improved by Landsat's thermal band measurements, and one could argue we are reliant on these measurements. And they are only going to become more crucial in the coming years, given the circumstances. Uh, and so setbacks related to that particular data stream would be uh, would have a real and meaningful consequences on the ground. So some believe that promptly cloning Landsat is the right choice in this context. Uh, but others fear that such a step would delay innovation and ultimately harm our long-term capacity to provide Landsat class data over the long term within a cost the government can bear. So many, and many of us are eager to progress to a bright new hyperspectral future for land imaging and integration with LIDAR platforms and other data streams. But how soon and at what risk and at what cost and with what partnerships? These are difficult questions and there are no quick or easy answers to them. So in the end, I am confident and OSTP is confident that we will succeed in forging a productive path forward. NASA and USGS really are joined at the hip in their commitment to the success of this effort, even as they weigh different perspectives and approaches. And we in the Executive Office of the President, we are behind them all the way and we stand ready to aid them in whatever way we can. So lastly, and most perhaps most importantly for today, we cannot succeed without you, our industry partners. It is your task to bring forward the best ideas, once again, some of you might say, uh, compete and ultimately partner with the government to build the next world-class civil land imaging system. So I'm excited about it. I hope you are, and I'm looking forward to the next step. Thank you.
Thank you, Peter. And now we'll turn the podium over to Sarah Riker, who will give you the presentation respect, perspective from the USGS. Apparently you've already seen these slides. <laughs> so let me just point out with pride that you're looking at a Landsat 8 image over Alaska. This is Copper River in all its remarkable fidelity and glory. <laughs> There we go. So first off, I think, as others have said, this mission is really well known. Um, but I'd like to point out that, that it sits at USGS for a number of reasons. Now, USGS is known for its long-term observing networks, and Landsat is certainly a flagship among them. Just like our stream gauge network and our seismic network, in red you can see that the reason that these are such critical data sets is we have a commitment to long-term preserval of the data, we have free and open data policies. We have really rigorous data quality standards. And we absolutely commit to continuity. So Landsat, in many ways, is culturally just a um, completely in consonance with the USGS mission for Earth science. The um, national space policy um, is also completely consonant with the USGS role. And we were delighted to see in the FY 2014 President's budget a reiteration of that role that Interior through USGS has a significant part in land imaging at the global scale and in archival and provision of that data, also in determining operational requirements and representing the user community. And I think the key is at the very bottom there. The partnership with NASA is the most important accomplishment we really have in this program. That's what's helped it last 41 years so far. And the direction that we're following over the next 25 years, according to the current policy, um, is absolutely what this program needs. We've had 41 years of fantastic success. So I'll give you a little history here. This timeline shows the eight Landsat missions to date. And at the bottom, in green, you can see the Department of the Interior's involvement since 1966 through the present. In blue is NASA's involvement, and you can see a number of other colors. We've had a number of partners over the year that have all played important roles. So I'll just call your attention to a few takeaways here. For one, the length of the partnership. And in 1966, the USGS director, William Pecora, championed the concept of a Landsat. And since 1972, we've had an unbroken record. So that's a phenomenal start the basis for everything we do today. Also, I'll point out the increasing role of USGS. There's more and more green on this chart at the bottom. You can follow along from the left. We started with a data archival and provision role. We took on ground system operations and flight operations, and most recently ground system development for Landsat 8. I'll also point out that we've had, as I said, many, many partners, many champions, it's a testament to the broad importance and applicability of Landsat data. On the federal side, NOAA and, let's see, NOAA in red, USDA is a small gray blob, and DOD are all important parts of the Landsat family tree here. And also in yellow on the chart, um, there was a failed attempt at commercializing Landsat. And in that period was the one launch failure, actually, um, Landsat 6. Um, there was also an attempt to commercialize the data stream and recover costs um, that proved to decrease demand so steeply that the company went out of business and lent that return to federal hands. I think finally this timeline shows really clearly that while we've had a phenomenal 41 years of continuity, it's happened through luck and Landsat 5. You can see in the middle of this timeline um, Landsat 5's Guinness Book of World Records record-setting career of 29 years. And that got us through a number of, a number of fragile points in the program, but we can't, hap we can't count on it happening again. So luck and Landsat 5 have got us this far, but this 25-year plan is the better direction to go for the longevity of the program. I think you've already heard a fair amount of the NASA and USGS roles. In more specificity, we do lean on NASA for the technical expertise on the sensors, the satellites, and the launches. The space side is not our core business. NASA and USGS co-chair the Landsat Science Team, which is an incredible engine of productivity for the user community. 
Um, USGS critically documents the user's land imaging requirements, and that's a role we'll, we'll continue in the, in the current structure. Um, we develop the ground systems and fund them. We operate the satellites, and we have our traditional role of collecting, processing, archiving, and disseminating the data. Um, a little bit on our users. These are, these are major users who have downloaded significant amounts of data from the Eros Center. And you can see that um, as befits a program sitting inside the Department of the Interior, Landsat data are used intensively to assess land use and land cover change for fire science and fire management. Um, the educational sector is, is using it more and more. Um, ecosystem science and monitoring, agriculture, forest science and management, water resources, there are many other uses, but um, all of these really correspond to the, the major economic engines of the country. Landsat is used by an incredibly wide community. Many of you have probably seen this graph, perhaps not the June 2013 version, but the trend looks similar. These are digital scenes distributed since just before the free data policy of 2008 and since. And I think beyond the obvious upward trend, under the free data policy, we, fee we see a few notable changes. Users have shifted to downloading in multiple years of data for the same location. So users aren't simply going for whatever comes from the most current satellite. Users under the free data policy are able to use the entire 41-year archive and to do analysis of change in a way they've never been able to before. Usage now is looking half operational and half research. That's quite a change also. We see usage expanding in every sector, but this tells us that there's still more innovation to come, and at the same time, the operational community has an even stronger need for Landsat than in the past. Um, also, an increasing number of users describe themselves as, as end users. And that says that the data are more readily accessible than ever before. We have people who are not purely remote sensing scientists who are accessing these data. And that's a significant trend. So as to what people are downloading, um, Landsat 7 is operating beautifully. Thank you, everyone who had a part in that. Users give it very high marks for data quality. Landsat 7 data distribution remains very strong, in fact, um, people still rely on Landsat 7 and Landsat 8. Um, Landsat 8 does not by any means replace 7. The users who depend on an eight-day repeat data collection cycle um, now are getting what they need. Um, now, in keeping with that last slide, our, our White House colleagues looked at that graph of increasing demand. And they said, that's very nice, USGS. Please increase it further. And more specifically, um, this year and last year, they've directed us to make the data more usable, more accessible. And one, one hurdle that we feel still remains is now that we have internet data distribution, we have big computing resources, et cetera, um, the data are still very complex. In fact, the Landsat 8 data stream is so rich that the user community will likely have some catching up to do in learning to work with it. Um, but we feel that we need to develop additional standard products that incorporate more of our remote sensing science into the data products to make the data more usable to a wider variety of decision makers. So we have a significant initiative going in that area. And the new, um, the new Landsat surface reflectance products are now available on demand through the Earth Explorer. And surface reflectance algorithms are in development for Landsat 8 data. This is an, an enormous change for the community and will result in users spending a lot less time um, and computing horsepower having to pre-process data. We're working on um, a number of issues, a number developing a number of variables that are going to be useful to our natural resource manager um, colleagues elsewhere in interior and at the state and local level, and are also useful to the global climate modeling community, such as surface water extent, burned area extent, snow cover, etc. We have a number of a number of major products coming out in the future. And again, we feel that this is a future direction for an earth science agency to really 
um, make Landsat data as usable and widely decision supportive as possible in the new operational Landsat program. I'll give you a little history on how in, on other ways that we're studying our user base. In 2012, um, USGS and NASA did a survey of a number of applications of Landsat data. We tried to document um, the needs, um, data needs supporting those applications and, and ultimately to determine the impacts of particular potential mission designs. So this is the basis on which we intend to make decisions about which requirements meet our users' needs. So we collected data on representative applications. We didn't try to survey all of them. They are uncountably many. It's a good problem to have. Um, we identified a number of really well-established operational uses and a few emerging applications as well, looking at future directions. We structured this analysis to connect to other ongoing analyses, the interagency and international use of societal benefit areas. And interestingly, one, one finding we immediately came to is that Landsat data um, are so mature and so broadly applicable that every societal benefit area depends on Landsat data. We also structured this analysis to, um, to lead into our new requirements project in which we are actively collecting um, users' inputs on, on the kinds of decisions they are making and the information products they need for that and specifically what types of data from Landsat and from other land imaging sources they're using for that purpose. So this is just an example um, of the kind of analysis that we did. We traced back from the types of decisions being made to the information products. And you can see on the right, we've got columns of spectral requirements. We've got columns of revisit requirements. And in green are the requirements, are the characteristics of the data that users told us were absolutely required for current operational applications. And blue are the characteristics that would be helpful for their applications. And so this looks at a variety of, of applications in vegetation characterization and fire response, et cetera. But this is the type of analysis we did last year, and this is the type of analysis that we continue to do in our requirements assessment as we are really preparing the, you know, the groundwork for looking at the options that all of you give to us. We will be basing our assessment on applications and user needs in the science community and in the natural resource decision-making community. So a snapshot of the kinds of conclusions that we drew from that, that analysis I think may be helpful to you in, in understanding how we, we approach this kind of ask. Um, essentially, our 2012 work confirmed a number of operational uses of Landsat capabilities. On the spectral front, there are a lot of visible near-infrared um, systems out there. Um, our study confirmed that the shortwave infrared and thermal infrared are absolutely key to Landsat. Only 10% of Landsat applications can be satisfied with the veneer bands alone. Um, we need the SWIR in more than 75% of those applications. So this is an unusual system and the applications that are really actively in use are, are all very well tuned to use all of its capabilities. About a third of the applications we looked at absolutely required thermal data, um, but most of the applications actually used TIER for accurate identifi identification of clouds. Spatially, um, our study essentially confirmed the 30, 30 meter resolution, the heritage resolution, as ideal for characterizing both anthropogenic and natural changes on the landscape. In terms of revisit, um, eight day looks like the sweet spot for about 70% of the applications that we looked at. There are a number of applications, or at least we identified 10%, I'm sure there are more, that require um, better than eight day revisit. In most of those cases, people are buying commercial data to augment um, the Landsat data. So this is an example of the, the kind of thought process that we have been going through at the USGS in shaking out our existing capabilities and confirming whether those are in fact the user's requirements for the future. And to date, our analysis says yes. So that is one of the, one of the inputs to, to our thinking going forward. 
um, based on what we know to date, our view is that in what I'll call Landsat 9 timeframe, by which I mean data acquisition beginning about 2018, the end of the design life for Landsat 8, there are a few options available that meet our requirements as we understand them today. And those range from, as Peter said, a clone of Landsat 8 to some options that require new technology. Um, there are probably a few possibilities if we act soon. The number of possibilities probably diminishes over time. Um, and the, the big trades here are cost and risk. And in this budget environment, um, those are the key parameters. There are a number of partial solutions that, um, that may help the user community should Landsat 7 um, die early or should we lose the Class C thermal instrument on Landsat 8. Um, as I showed on the last slide though, the partial solutions, um, none of them provides the combination of bands that Landsat 8 has. Um, and so at best we can partially mitigate a data gap when that day comes. We saw over the last year in our analysis that technology development and demonstration should really significantly reduce costs, potentially improve performance, and perhaps decrease risk, but not quite yet. As far as we know, we don't see technologies out there that can do this for us in the near term. So we are very interested in hearing from industry about what you see in the near and medium term. We see a number of promising instruments and platforms. Um, we're very interested in hyperspectral imaging, um, in small sats, cheaper launch vehicles, et cetera. A lot of those are, are NASA's issues, but they're also our issues because these impinge on the kinds of instruments and the kinds of bands and the kind of revisit that we can get for our program. But I think in each of those cases, um, we see significant development required. So our user community is concerned and they want to know what's the right path technologically to get on to be sure that their data stream is maintained. We're also very interested in developments in ground systems the ground system is our responsibility and um, an operational ground system 24-7 um, delivering giant volumes of data is quite an undertaking and as we are working to better serve data in more meaningful ways to wider audiences, we're very interested in your ideas on what's the future direction for all of those technologies. So in conclusion, I'll just say I think the key challenges from our point of view for this RFI are the combination of having a near-term need for continuity, given we have two satellites, one of which is nearing the end of fuel, and the other one has a Class C instrument on it, and at the same time a long-term need for this long-term plan for continuity, and we hope improvement. We'd like to better serve those data users. And connecting the, the near and the long-term um, is important to us in terms of the data stream. We want the data stream to be backward compatible. We don't really care what the technologies are that get it there. We're really technology neutral on this. We are interested in the data and the users that we represent are interested in the data. In our view, both challenges need to consider what are the, what's the right requirement set that preserves that continuity? How do we, when new technologies come along, create that backward compatibility? We definitely need your take on the risk, how to, how to work with the risk tolerances of this program. As we are in operational <coughs> mode, um, there's a certain amount of risk. And we have to find the right level, but there's a certain amount of intolerance to risk among our users. And right now, the users are pretty intolerant to risk because the program has been fragile for too many decades. If we can get into a better mode in which we are not always down to one satellite or one and a sick one, then the users may feel differently about that. And overall, um, all of us in the executive branch feel the pressure to lower overall costs. And that's on the space side and it's also on the ground side. That's the reality we're in right now. And so again, um, anything industry has to contribute here, we will take very seriously. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, and now uh, to follow Sarah is uh, Mike Freilich, Earth Science Division Director from the NASA De Science Perspective. Thanks, Steve, Sarah, 
Peter, wherever you're from, David. Uh, thanks to all the members of the Sustained uh, Land Imaging Steering Committee uh, and the Architecture Study Team, and especially thanks to uh, all of you from the private sector, from the academic and our international partner communities uh, who are here and uh, who are uh, participate or who are participating remotely. Uh, I'm not going to say anything as it turns out that you haven't already heard. Uh, sometimes multiple times. We're all actually warm-up acts for Dave Jarrett, uh, who's going who's to get, get to, the, to the meat of things. Uh, but it's actually interesting that at many different levels in our agencies and between the agencies and the executive office of the president, we're all saying the same things. And I can guarantee you that there wasn't one secret speechwriter uh, who just distributed mimeographed copies. We have been working together for a long time, as Sarah mentioned. Uh, we are extremely well aligned in the executive branch uh, about our ultimate objectives. And the key now is to figure out the best, most efficient, most sustainable way uh, of getting there. Uh, so Sarah Riker did uh, a, a great job of summarizing uh, the wide variety of uses uh, for the moderate resolution land imaging data. She touched on the needs of the broad, uh, broad user community and uh, indeed highlighted the uh, fantastic contributions uh, of USGS to date in generating information products uh, globally uh, and making them widely available. Uh, you've heard it before, but we must drive this fact home. Three things have really come together uh, over the years to provide our nation and indeed the world uh, with this invaluable uh, satellite-based terrestrial uh, data set that is used for research and is also more and more forming the basis for uh, decision support. So the first thing is obviously, as, as Sarah uh, pointed out, uh, our investment, the nation's investment in the hardware, and in the ground processing and the distribution systems. Secondly, though, uh, the really ingenious contributions from the scientists and uh, those many in the user communities, in academia, uh, and in government at all levels, and the private sector. Many uh, actually funded uh, from NASA and USGS these ingenious contributions that have uh, allowed advances to be made even though several of the key bands, several of the key instruments, several of the key spacecraft have been significantly degraded for years and in some cases for decades by various technical reasons. But still, these data have been used to generate information products that have advanced their utility, that have advanced our knowledge of the planet that we live in, live on, and have advanced our ability to make good decisions and justifiable decisions at the governmental level. Uh, and as, as Sarah said uh, quite directly, uh, the third and maybe the most important thing uh, that, has come, uh, that has come into the mix uh, has been uh, what I wrote down as generous dollops of good fortune. Enabling satellites that have been designed to last for years to in fact last for uh, many decades. And our nation's sort of present virtuous situation with regard to the historical 41 year uh, data set has really probably resulted more from heroics and good luck uh, then from careful design and execution uh, of a multi-decadal, multi-mission global land imaging system. And so what we're embarked on right now, what we're describing and enlisting your help to do today uh, and, in the, and in the coming months is in fact the design of such a sustained and sustainable, when I say sustainable, I really mean affordable, this global land imaging system. Uh, now, I actually wrote down here for the first time, but I won't say that. Uh, in the U.S., at least, the administration has committed uh, budgetarily 
for the first time. I really think it is for the first time in a five-year president budget. Uh, the administration is committed to designing and then to implementing this long-term land imaging program that goes beyond the next satellite or the next processing system up upgrade. The administration really wants to transcend operational in retrospect, as Sarah pointed out, now people are going back and getting 41-year time series from particular locations. Uh, and the administration wants to get to operational in fact through a system that's actually designed to take into account present and future needs for a system that's designed from the start to be affordable and therefore a system that's predictable and then I'm sure will be successful. We have to design it with quite a bit of thought. It's not going to happen naturally. We have a long 41-year time series that shows us it won't happen naturally. The study that we in NASA and USGS are embarking on together, for which we're requesting your inputs and your ideas, is an essential step. Okay? Between now and mid-August of next year, we all together, NASA, USGS, with you, are going to be examining a range of approaches to acquiring the demonstrably useful data and the different system ideas that we're going to be looking at are going to have different costs, they're going to have different continuity and robustness and technology risks, they're going to have different capabilities, they're going to age differently over the multiple decades in which uh, the system needs to, uh, to operate, and they're going to utilize and benefit from multiple different partnerships. And what we're doing here is really trying to cast a broad net for strategic system ideas from which we will endeavor to develop system designs that balance the available resources with the desired capabilities now and also over the coming decades. So we really want to have a system that simultaneously has acceptable robustness and appropriate gap risks, that recognizes the need for some level of technology infusion over the lifetime in order to allow new uses and to benefit from new measurement techniques, a system that complements and appropriately makes use of the capabilities that we can reasonably expect to be accessible from our international and private sector partners, and a system that can be implemented because it fits into the foreseeable budgets. We need to have all of those. But a system that has all of these characteristics is inevitably going to involve some level of compromise in each one of them. And the key is going to be to balance the risks and the costs and the capabilities appropriately. It's pretty easy to identify the sort of endpoints of the design in which you pick one characteristic and you weight it very, very highly and forget about the other ones. Okay, but it's a lot harder to discover the design sweet spots and to get agreement regarding the appropriateness of the resulting compromises. That's the challenge that we're asking for your help on. We're interested in your ideas for sustained land imaging system designs from your standpoint with the weightings that you think are right. We're going to assemble and combine those ideas and hopefully come up with a successful approach uh, for our nation and frankly for our species because we're in this for all humanity. Uh, and I think that all humanity is actually quite pleased that the U.S. with partners uh, has taken the lead for the last 40 years and will continue to play an active role. Uh, I'm going to be happy to discuss uh, actual specifics uh, and to respond to questions uh, after Dave Jarrett actually says something new and different and substantive uh, for the first time in uh, not quite an hour. Uh, so uh, next up. 
Okay, now you can turn off your Blackberries and listen because you'll hear something new and substantive. So <laughs> Dave Jarrett will give the parameters of the study and uh, the path forward, and then we'll go to Q&A. So Dave, you're up. Not too much of a setup. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dave Jarrett, and uh, Mike laid out the challenge for us, and he laid this out to me, uh, shortly following the launch of LDCM, now Landsat 8, operating on orbit. Uh, before we go to the future, I would like to recognize the past. There are several people in the audience that contributed to the su success of Landsat 8 and getting it up and going. Uh, Mr. Del Dent Genstrom is Deputy Project Manager. Uh, Dr. Jim Irons is the Project Scientist. Uh, Jim Nelson from USGS helped get the ground system ready to go. Evan Webb is here uh, as the system engineer for the, the mission, and Doug Daniels is also here from USGS as well. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for the success we've seen to date with that mission. It's fantastic. Now for the future. If I go the right direction, I'll go in the future. There we go. Uh, back in the spring of this year, uh, the President came forward when he released the budget for FY14, and this was the specific direction he gave NASA and the USGS that we will spend the, uh, the year doing these studies as, as uh, Mike Freilich laid out, uh, and uh, we are to weigh the different uh, variables, the measure, different measurement approaches, cost, and risk of a viable and, and the key is the long-term land imaging program, and that's really what we're focused on here, and we look forward to putting together as a re result of this study. But we have very clear direction on, on what we're supposed to do here. Uh, as was stated earlier, this, this builds on uh, the 41-year history, and most recently uh, the collaboration we had with Landsat 8 between NASA and USGS, uh, for the study phase, NASA will lead the overall system architecture study utilizing our space systems engineering expertise. Uh, USGS will support us in all aspects of that study, and USGS will represent the consolidated needs and desires of the Landsat community, as uh, Sarah pointed out earlier, and they'll provide their expert analyses of data processing and data dissemination in ground systems as part of that study. Uh, for the implement implementation phase, we will, again, uh, do a s very similarly to what we did with Landsat 8, where NASA will design and build and launch uh, the space segments of the system that we come up with. And uh, then we will hand it over to USGS, who will have uh, put together the ground system or any ground system improvements that, that we need beyond Landsat 8 and uh, operate, operate whatever uh, space-borne assets we put on orbit. Uh, again, continuing on the success of the past. Uh, as far as the study goes, uh, we intend to define a system that will deliver, again, the sustained global land imaging, multispectral and thermal red information uh, for a 20-year period or longer. Uh, beginning at the end of the design life of Landsat 8. Uh, we need to provide options which will consider various weightings of the near-term capability, continuity, or gap risk mitigation, if you will, and technology infusion over the system's lifetime. And uh, bottom line is we have to do this within the, the budget that's been laid out for us by the administration. Uh, we will also consider refined capabilities requested by the user communities. Um, as Sarah pointed out, uh, these evolve, are evolving over time and uh, finding new, new uses on a regular basis and from what people want, want to use the data for and the data products that they need. Uh, we want to consider um, new measurement approaches that you may have as the industry has been uh, producing using their own R&D efforts to, to further the state of the art of uh, land imaging. And uh, we also want to pursue uh, potential international and private sector partnerships as well. 
and see what, where, where we might be able to partner with, with others to do this task laid out in front of us. And our, our deadline for this is August 15th of 2014. Uh, that's a typo there. Uh, we, we won't quite, we didn't quite make that deadline. Uh, but uh, we owe a report back with recommendations and an actual implementation plan by August of next year so that we can be ready to move out and uh, get into the implementation phase. Uh, along these lines, um, programmatic stability recognizes that the system cost is a critical parameter in the overall design and we will have to keep this in mind in all of the different architectural trade studies that we do. Uh, the NASA budget includes the development, launch, commissioning, and commissioning of spaceborne assets. And the USGS bus budget includes mission operations, ground systems, and data archiving and distribution. Uh, what we need to keep in mind is trade-offs between the ground and space and ground elements must factor in the budget constraints of both agencies as we go forward. Uh, now de to uh, how we intend to do this as far as the architecture study approach. Uh, we are in the process, NASA and USGS have been working together since uh, late spring uh, between U NASA headquarters and USGS headquarters in planning our path forward. Uh, we are in the process now of establishing a land imaging architecture study team out of the NASA Earth Systematic Missions Program Office at Goddard. And uh, this will include representatives from various NASA centers, USGS, uh, JPL, aerospace, and others. We are, they will be informed by what the responses that we get to the RFAI that we'll be releasing later this afternoon, and I'll tell, tell you details about that in just a few minutes. Uh, conduct independent analyses as well, and we will, they will conduct charge to conduct architecture feasibility studies. Uh, as, as we've indicated or hinted at, we will be releasing an RFI today. It'll go out at 4.30 this afternoon and be posted with responses due in 30 days. And we will use those inputs. The architecture study team will be using those inputs uh, as they put the architectures together. That is, that is the major intent of releasing this RFI. Um, several months down the road, uh, the architecture team will come back to us uh, and present their initial findings to NASA and the USGS leadership. And uh, at that point, we will go out to the community and have a community workshop to communicate those results and the options that we have remaining on the table and get some uh, community feedback on, on those options. Uh, once we get that feedback, uh, we will refine our architecture options uh, and them ready to present to NASA and USGS headquarters for final review and out, out or evaluation, and then we'll be ready to go forward and meet our deadline in August of uh, presenting uh, an implementation plan for a sustainable land imaging system. That means both uh, space and ground systems, and we will provide that to both the Office of Management and Budget and the, that other office, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, as Steve Boltz mentioned earlier, we will be uh, engaging the community over time. We, we want to be open and transparent in this effort that we're going forward with. Uh, in October, we have a Landsat science team. We'd like to take the opportunity there to brief our immediate stakeholders uh, of what our plans are going forward. Uh, in the December time frame or thereabouts, we intend to have a USGS and NASA intend to have a user's workshop to further refine the requirements as we go forward. Uh, that's a very important part of this study. And then there are some other meetings downstream that are outlined here. Uh, the American Meteorologi Meteorological Science Society in February and uh, ASPRS JC meeting in April 2014. Uh, now down to the details. Uh, request for information that we're going to release. It's, a, it's a issued by NASA. It's a joint. Uh, it's on behalf of the joint, archi joint agency architecture team, and we're seeking information concepts, 
information on system concepts and innovation, innovative approaches for the sustainable land Im imaging architecture. Uh, we anticipate that this will include quite a range of uh, different solutions, uh, all of which are listed here. We have large and, or large and small dedicated spacecraft, large being very similar to uh, what we're flying now. Uh, formation flying, where we may fly uh, sensors on several different spacecraft that return the same data products for the user community. Potentially flying hosted payloads on other platforms that uh, other countries or commercial organizations are flying. Uh, we may pursue integration of other land imaging data sets that are coming from other other sources as well, besides those that uh, that NASA and USGS decide we want to fly. Uh, we would like to. We know the, there are other countries and other space organizations around the world that are also uh, interested in land imaging and have their own uh, fleet of satellites as well. And we'd like to collaborate with them downstream to see if we can. Uh, keep the costs under control for, for not only the United States, but other countries as well and other space agencies. Uh, in addition to uh, the flight segment, we're also seeking information on uh, current and future planned ground system capabilities uh, similar to those or in light of those uh, provided by the USGS Aeros Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. RFI responses is, should recognize, and this is very important, um, that lowering the system's overall cost to the nation is a very important goal for NASA and USGS, and that implementing an affordable system is an essential programmatic requirement of the U.S. government. Uh, what we are looking for with this RFI is especially uh, complete system architecture solutions from, from you, or the industry, and our foreign partners and, and others um, for the entire system. Uh, we're going to provide you with the Landsat 8 reference parameters that show what, what we're providing now to the user community as a reference for what we would intend to provide downstream or what we're required to provide downstream. Um, but we're also asking for partial solutions where somebody may you may have an instrument or uh, something that will provide partial data set to meet at least part of our needs. And NASA, NASA and USGS will build an architecture based on the various components that we get in. Uh, another important part of this whole effort is, as was stated earlier, it's, it's not just the next mission. It's the next series of missions uh, over the course of 20, so 20 or so years, and we want to we're interested in ideas of how to infuse new technology and the evolution of measurement techniques over that time frame so that we can, we're not stuck in a stati static situation where we're flying the same sensors for the next two or three decades. For the technical details or the nitty gritty details of the RFI responses, uh, this is the type of information we're looking for. Uh, we want to know who you are and how to get in touch with you. Uh, we'd like an abstract up front uh, to know to know what your what system you are uh, proposing. Uh, description of the system concept of, and how it addresses the objectives and the requirements in this RFI and the maturity both now or in the future if, if it's a future capability. What your approach is for developing that capability and the timeline for doing so. Uh, of interest is the performance capability and how that the performance of the system that you're recommending uh, measures against uh, what we are providing now. And again, that's in the Landsat 8 reference parameters that you will see. Uh, Landsat, over the course of time, has been very careful to, to provide calibration and validation of the data between between the satellites that we're flying as well as ground sites, and that's a very important part going forward. So we want to know what your plans and methods are uh, for providing that calibrated data and validating that it meets the specifications. Um, 
We also are very interested in uh, technology evolution and infusion, as I said before, and how you plan on doing that and maturing that technology. Last but not least, and uh, very importantly, is your system cost estimate uh, and uh, what you what you believe it'll take to build and to develop and build and implement and operate the system that you are coming forward with and the accompanying assumptions and rationale behind that. As I said earlier, the RFI will come out at 4.30 this afternoon. You can find it on this website. Uh, and responses are due 30 days later, October 18th. They should be addressed to me, uh, and they should be sent in to this email address here uh, in a PDF with this subject line. Responses should be in a PDF format. With a tw There's a 20-page limit on it, and no greater than 8 megabytes in size. Uh, one thing to note here is that we, we are only accepting materialable, material that is suitable for full and open distribution and no proprietary export controlled classified or sensitive material should be provided. Uh, the purpose of these, the RFI and the inputs that we get back are so that it enables us to build an architecture using these ideas going forward in the best way that we see fit. Uh, based on the outcome of the trade studies that we do. So it's very important that we have, we have information that we can use freely and openly amongst the team to do so. Uh, and the last one's a footnote that we're required to put in everything is this is for planning and information purposes only and not to be construed as a commitment by the government to enter into a contractual agreement, nor will the government pay for any information solicited. Going forward, uh, we've alluded to this a little bit. Uh, we'll get the RFI inputs back uh, next month. Uh, the architecture team will perform initial system and specialty trade studies also in the, in the same time frame, first quarter of uh, next fiscal year, and uh, USGS will take the lead in conducting the user's workshop. Second quarter, we will triage the multiple system architecture approaches that the architecture team comes up with. Uh, and conduct the community workshop to solicit community feedback on the narrowed set of options that we're looking at. With uh, in the third quarter, refining those final system architectures and producing the final report and implementation plan for report out in August of next year. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Steve. Well, fortunately, we're ahead of schedule, so we have a, not, a great amount of time for questions and answers. So that was the, that's the scope of the formal presentations and discussion. Now it's opening up to the floor, and it's, it's up to you. So I think we have microphones placed around here. If you have a question, please come to the microphone. Is that the only one we have, or do we have down? Yeah. We'll bring the microphone to you. Again, just mention your, um, your affiliation and your name and ask your questions, and we'll do our best to answer. So opened up. Hopefully there will be some questions. Good afternoon. I'm Randy Friedel from Jet Propulsion Laboratory. My question is for uh, Sarah Riker and maybe some of the other panelists. Um, understandably, you, in your presentation, you discussed uh, new products that you're trying to generate to, to meet user uh, desires and needs. And that's quite understandable. But certainly in the framework of trying to create a very low-cost uh, option space, um, those things can be at odds with each other in the sense that you sometimes have to start from a core set of applications that are of the most compelling uh, nature. And so my question is, do you have a process? Or are you trying to distill down a prioritization of the various products that are produced now or even ones that you're considering for the future to give a sense to the architecture team as to sort of what some of the core foundational uh, measurement requirements there might be for a future system. I think so. Yes, first off, yes, we do prioritize, absolutely. Um, 
right now, I've shown you a fair amount of the thinking that we've recently been through in um, getting our arms around what kinds of applications are out there and the roles they're playing in decision making. So we are still in a study phase in terms of the larger application set. There are so many applications out there. In fact, our new Landsat user survey is about to come out, and it's remarkable how usage has expanded across many domains and different types of users. The applications are already more numerous than we can really fully identify. But we are studying our users and the applications out there, and also, as I said, have an intramural and extramural um, set of studies going um, to keep furthering the development of those applications in particular areas. So, no, I don't have a, a precise answer for you right now, but we do have a number of those materials that I showed earlier, and some of the, some of the you know, pertinent discussion can certainly be shared. So we can provide more to the architecture team in terms of our understanding of the user base and the applications face, what we see as the current operational sphere as well as the emerging research uses. Of course, one of the hardest things for anyone to answer is where is this going in the future, especially given the incredible explosion in usage of Landsat data. The number of uses keeps increasing with the number of downloads. So it's a hard thing to track, but we are working at getting our, getting our arms around it. Um, that said, everything that we have looked at to date tells us that the current capability set really is the current requirements set. And some of that is simply because the data set is so mature, the data stream has been around for so long, that users have come up with great uses for absolutely every part of that data stream. But nonetheless, that's the, that's the state of play right now. That is the current set that we have the research behind to support it. Okay. Next. Hi, this is for uh, Dave Jarrett, um, Bruce Campbell from uh, ATK Space. Um, the RFI information in the Landsat, uh, uh, let's see if I get this right, LCDM? <laughs> no, no, LDCM. No, L -L -L <laughs> okay. Um, the information that you're going to provide to us, does it include uh, sufficient information about the current instrument designs and requirements? does not cover the design, it covers the performance of the instrument. Okay. The and um, does it also discuss the ground systems that are currently in use and their capabilities? No, we did not include the ground systems in that. It was primarily for reference for the, the data that we were getting back from, from the spacecraft. However, is it not safe to say I asked my colleagues that uh, there are many open literature uh, publications, papers, et cetera, which describe aspects of the instruments, their capabilities, and their design, as well as uh, details of the ground system, algorithms, validation, et cetera. Yes, all of, all of that is out there. Hi, this question is um, for Sarah Riker and anyone else who wants to jump in. I'm Lars Jared from Draper Laboratory. And I was, I was curious because this is something near and dear to my heart. Were you guys planning on taking as broad a view as possible in, of the user requirements in terms of measurement capability? And I'll give you an example. In your charts, you point out that only 10% of the user needs can be met without the thermal band. Was that the number? The, some number like that, a very, only a very small number of user users can, can use their product without the thermal band. And so what I'm curious about is probably that other 90% isn't, uh, they don't all need the same aspects of what thermal the thermal band provides. And so if we make sure we're taking as broad a view as possible, then we can also include other sensor types or sensing modalities to mix in with, mix in to make sure, oh, actually without the thermal band, we can do most of what these people need if we add X. And X might not be the thermal band. And so... It's, I think it's critically important to make sure we're keeping those options as open as possible instead of strict sensor measurement requirements uh, and tying those directly to customer product needs. So. Yeah, I'll agree with that. And in the analysis that we did last year and in the RFI that you'll see later, um, you'll see that it's fairly wide open. Um, it calls for partial solutions or somewhat orthogonal solutions. 
It's not looking for exactly um, what we already have, and we are absolutely willing to um, to go to th through the analysis and look at what a slightly different solution set might do for our user base. And getting ahead of that analysis is why we've been doing the assessment of applications that we have to date. I think just a quick follow on, are the customer needs yet broken down beyond what the Landsat spectral bands already provide? Are they more basic definition of what the customer needs are? Or are they only character, character categorized in terms of the existing Landsat bands? I think doing that first is necessary for understanding how to meet customer requirements. Uh, the USGS and Sarah, you can fill in here where necessary is, is actually reaching down to the customers to understand the measurements they need, what, what kind of measurements they need to be made, and then filtering that up through through the process to see what kind of uh, technical capabilities are required to meet those measurements specifically. And they've got a head start on that with a pilot program at USGS headquarters, and we, in, we intend to incorporate that into the study. That's great. Thank you. Right. To the degree possible, we'd like to understand the, the uses of the data, not the, not the type of measurement that is made itself. So, yes, we want to be able to broaden the engineering, re-engineering process so that we can figure, f deliver the product with, and let us design the system that best meets it or the system, the combination of me measurements that best meet it. Good afternoon. Bob Leroy from Lockheed Martin. Uh, today we heard uh, how important this study is, uh, how very interested and everything like that. Yet all I hear is a 30-day RFI starting this afternoon that you're requesting for industry. Here we have an industry day, but it doesn't seem like there is much request for information for industry to participate in and continue to offer uh, those kind of ideas. Is there something else that's going to be other than just an RFI? I mean, I've been on programs uh, of less importance than this where you might have industry do a study to look at various options to provide uh, solutions both immediate and future, and I didn't hear any of that today. No, that, it's, a, it's an important point that you make. I think that uh, where we are now needs to be put into the context of at least the last several years. Uh, the, the nation, without the commitment, the nation uh, has clearly been, uh, been interested in uh, ideas uh, from outside the government uh, on land imaging for some time. Uh, it was probably, what, about two years ago or so that, uh, that a major, uh, the NRC held a major meeting of experts where uh, we saw many of uh, new ideas that, that people had been thinking about. The NRC just completed uh, a study on, uh, on land imaging. Uh, and USGS, in a different incarnation uh, a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago or so, uh, issued a similar but not identical RFI looking for ideas for uh, for future land land imaging uh, approaches. So this RFI is in the context of those other activities, which if you step back and look at them, I think actually does uh, correspond to uh, a sustained interest and sustained interactions on the part uh, of the of the government. Given the tensions that you heard about uh, between uh, the desire for some level of continuity and the desire for a, uh, a longer term system, uh, we felt that it was uh, that it was prudent and realistic, uh, given what also what we knew about the level of thought in the community, uh, to go out with this limited RFI uh, and then see what we get and see whether uh, the ideas there can be uh, incorporated into a, long, a longer term system design. So, so, I'm, so okay. the RFI that we uh, provided everybody at USGS in particular uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, you expect something different? Are there, are there different questions being asked uh, that you want input from us? Yeah, there are, there are a couple of different, uh, different portions to this. 
Uh, one of them is a uh, greater in emphasis on full design and long term. Where we're talking about technology and fusion. We're talking uh, about, uh, about cost constraints. Okay. A second, uh, and, and let, let, let me say a little bit more about the cost constraint part. Uh, now, as opposed to previously with the other RFI, uh, the administration's uh, budget proposal is on the table year by year for the next five years, assuming that Congress uh, uh, does pass uh, the administration's FY14 budget as, as we hope that they will. Uh, the economic situation in the country is frankly different now and not necessarily better uh, than it was when the previous RFI went out. Uh, and we know that people have been, that that has caused people to think uh, more and differently in the cost constrained uh, arena. And finally, by making this RFI uh, not proprietary, uh, we are hoping to be able to utilize those ideas uh, that we get in, uh, in potentially more effective, uh, more efficient, and more integrative fashion. Thank you. I'd like to add two Mike, points to. Let me just add, actually. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. Since the first RFI came up, um, I think it was important that the first RFI actually solicited detailed proprietary information, and that was really formative. We wouldn't be here today, I think, without that RFI. The inputs to that RFI demonstrated that there are viable near-term to medium-term, I mean five to ten year solutions for Landsat continuity, <coughs> and those findings were well enough substantiated that our White House colleagues um, agreed that that the administration's commitment to the long haul really was viable. So that, that is the groundwork for why we're here today. And what I hope we'll get from this RFI is the long-term piece that the administration has recently asked us for. When we put out the first RFI, um, I think the administration expected us to look at the next Landsat, and we came back and said, no, we need to look two Landsats ahead. Now they've gone us one better, and they've asked us to look 25 years ahead. So what I hope we can do with this new RFI is stitch together a coherent plan that addresses our near-term real continuity problem, which is Landsat 7's um, low fuel, as well as laying out a path toward the next 25 years. And to just to add to what Sarah and Mike just said, this, this RFI is, as we started at the beginning, is the start of the process for developing the, the long-term uh, land imaging program. Um, the ac architecture study team will be standing, is standing up now. It's going to be taking this input and others, and they have the authority and expectation they may be going out with specific studies to the community as well, not just an internal look on themselves, but talking, looking for expert advice through, through requested studies, directed studies, et cetera, in a broader context. And the output of this could be a near-term solution and a mid-range and a long-term solution, which requires, again, follow-ups on how are we going to fill the, the solution. And, and 15 years may look a little different, so we have to follow up with studies with industry and others to see how that's going to work. So this is the start and not the end of our interaction with the community, certainly, and, and with industry for the studies that we may be asking for. Uh, Caroline with Ball Aerospace. So as a follow-up to that, I was wondering if the RFI is going to uh, be any more specific. You, I think on one of the charts you said to include a budget estimate on or a cost estimate on your solution, um, and yet we talk about the short-term and long-term nature of what you're looking for. Um, will it get any more specific in terms of the time frame that you might be looking for in the cost solution space that you would expect from us? Well, the, the, the time frame really ba is based on what you're coming back, what you're, what concept you're proposing back to us. You may have, we, we would like to see a concept that spans the gamut of the, the 20 years with technology infusion. So then we would expect a budget or a cost profile that, that comes back and reflects that plan or that proposal. Whereas if you have a point solution where you have an instrument that you want to fly and you're suggesting you fly it as a gap filler in the 2018 to 2020 time frame, then we would expect to see a budget estimate that reflects that time frame as well. Thank you. 
I could, could just add to that. Uh, the President's FY14 uh, budget proposal, which came out uh, in April, uh, gives a line and a ramp up uh, for at least the uh, NASA spaceborne portion of the sustained uh, land imaging program. Uh, and by NASA, I mean that's the money coming into NASA for the spaceborne uh, portion. It doesn't mean spent by NASA on NASA stuff necessarily simply. Uh, we implement, we don't necessarily build, obviously. Uh, I think that it's not unreasonable uh, in this present uh, economic environment uh, to think that budgets will not be increasing in the out years uh, beyond that. And But for a program of this importance, they probably uh, realistically would not be decreasing either. So I think it gives you the ramp and it gives you the the level uh, for the uh, you know for for the long term out out years as best as anybody can probably predict. Back there. Yeah, a question in the back. All right. Okay, go ahead. Brian Lottman, Northrop Grumman Aerospace Systems. There was some discussion regarding space and ground trades. Uh, I think Dave, you had mentioned that. I was wondering if the, the panel could give some boundaries on the trade space on the ground. Let me try and answer and then you see whether, <laughs> <laughs> whether it like gets No. <laughs> <laughs> and and quite quite specifically, we are looking for good ideas for trades, recognizing the USGS portion in the President's FY14 budget and the NASA's, and NASA's portion in the FY14 budget. It would probably be something of a waste of time to expect that on the ground the USGS budget would have to double, okay, uh, or frankly even increase substantially. Uh, but we are not being prescriptive. We're looking for the good ideas uh, that, that you have for, uh, for different architectures. I like Mike's first answer, no. <laughs> um, a little beyond that, though, obviously there are a number of... <laughs> I should stop with your answer, shouldn't I? But um, there are a number of, of specific trade-offs um, we have invested a lot in a new ground system for Landsat 8, and it's performing beautifully. Um, and obviously, it's cheaper for us to modify what we already have. Um, on the other hand, um, a number of the space system solutions that you all will likely come up with um, will not greatly resemble our current, current instruments and current data stream. So given that you will likely propose technologies that will cause some fluctuation in our ground system plans, um, we would like to hear from you um, what you foresee those differences being so that we can really assess the trades. And a, a part of our discussions uh, earlier this year, we were discussing, you know, you could design this really fancy, really special spacecraft that can do everything on board, but is that really necessary and, and could it be done more efficiently and more cost effectively on the ground? instead of building it into the space segment. And that was sort of where that, that was coming from in the RFI. Um, next. Okay. There's one up the top two. Stan Schneider, NASA retired. Um, <laughs> what organization is that? Uh, <laughs> also <laughs> NOAA retired, Army retired, anyway. Um, so I saw in one of the charts you want to have something in 2018 uh, for a new system to begin to mitigate against a gap and assure continuity. And it seems like you're going to have a plan in August 2014. Have you laid out all the milestones and key decision points from August 14 that would get you a system in 2018? Are you looking at for that from the people in this room? Um, I think, let me answer, and I'm sure Sarah will have something to say as well. 
what, um, what was identified is the mission life of Landsat 8, which is five years. Um, so we understand the requirement, the objective for continuity of the Landsat mission, um, and we also know that a mission life is not that we don't turn it off at the end of its mission lifetime. So one of the critical elements we have to do in the near term is to assess the probability of continuation, the reliability of our systems on orbit, and the, and the risk of a gap occurring, not 2018, 2015, 2016, 2017, and what mitigations we might have in place to uh, mitigate against a failure. Our objective, our overall objective, is to have a system that does not have a single point failure for any element of it. But we understand with Landsat 8, with Landsat 7 going away, is potentially has that. So it could fail for a number of different reasons, but the problem is the same, is to define a system, a robust overall system that has um, no single point failures and with, with, uh, ro with graceful degradation, if you will, if we have a problem. Now, so that's the answer is part of our study is to find backups if, we, if something does fail before we can get something on orbit, for example, and, and we are looking at that as a particular part of the study. And turn over to Sarah if you want to add to that. Yes, the, um, since we're talking about the 2018 near-term time frame, um, NASA and USGS have just gone through a very successful mission development and launch with Landsat 8, so we have a lot of experience to build on. And based on that, we have put together a detailed timeline, um, walking back from the objective of launching um, before we lose Landsat 7, or at the very least, before we lose Landsat 8. And we have stepped backward to look at the key decision points and where the roles um, with the space system and ground system developers should be at those decision points. And our conclusion is that for that kind of time frame, we have a few months right now to determine what's the right course of action. Um, some, of the, some of the options out there um, get less probable as time goes on, as we get farther from the development phase of Landsat 8. Um, so we, we feel some time pressure with this study and, and the timing of this RFI to get as much information as quickly as possible because we do have that timeline established and we will move it as we have to, but we're going into this understanding um, what the time trades are in the technical possibilities. And in addition, I want to point out that uh, we are in it for both the short term and the long term, and we in the U.S. are not the only players in the game anymore. And that is, I mean, that's, that's a thankful situation right now. Uh, the, uh, the European Union uh, and ESO on the development end uh, are uh, bringing online in the next uh, in the next couple of years, they're Sentinel-2, uh, the start of a uh, operational land imaging program there. They are close partners with us. USGS and NASA have been uh, interacting with ESA and the EU uh, for some years now on data exchange, et cetera. Uh, we have other international partners that are also poised to make contributions so there are mitigations to, uh, to help assure or to decrease the risk that the information in the near term will come to an end. We're not in a situation where we're operating at a vacuum. We're also not in a situation where we're saying, what's the next satellite? We're looking at it from the standpoint of the user who's not a satellite weenie who's saying, what information do I need to keep having over this entire time frame? And when you look at it that way, uh, the solution space uh, expands somewhat, uh, but the urgency to do something is clearly there, as Sarah and others have pointed out. I'll just, I completely agree with Mike, but I will qualify that. We, um, we will have an issue with thermal data, regardless of international partnerships, et cetera. There is no other source for what our users need. So that right now is, is the pressure point for the data gap. And following that one, we'll also have the, um, we'll also lose probably our eight day repeat at some point, unless we are able to establish those strong partnerships. In the back. 
Good afternoon. Uh, Jeff Laval from Marshall Space Flight Center at NASA. Uh, I'd like to just add a perspective of a 29-year career with NASA as a scientist and application scientist. Uh, and I'm really gratifying to look see the statistics about the use of the thermal data because several years ago, and I know there are a number of people in the audience who remember this, uh, thermal data was dropped from Landsat. And myself and another colleague put together a symposium at AGU to try to find out, okay, who's using this data? So it's really, really critical to understand not only the current users but the potential future users uh, of these data sets. And thank goodness it was a full court press, but they uh, got the thermal put back on. And we don't want another one of these oops times. We should have had this. Second, I think the biggest uh, enhancement I see in the Landsat program would be the repeat time, eight days, five days, because once you do that, then you move into a whole area that Landsat hasn't really been able to, to be utilized as completely uh, as one would like, and that's in agriculture. When you get to that kind of repeat time, you can look at the irrigation, uh, evapotranspiration, even productivity by using thermal data. And another area that's become apparent through NASA's applied sciences in public health is the people in the public health uh, area are just now understanding how valuable this data can be uh, in the use and study of public health and diseases and this sort of thing, particularly vector-borne uh, diseases. So it's really important, um, that repeat time. And then the other thing is, is that, um, you know, the next generation of scientists and users are in training now. And one of the programs is the NASA Develop Program. So if you want to look at a bunch of interesting uh, uses of this data, uh, look at EarthSign and look some of the Develop uh, Program. But um, I'm really p pleased to be involved with this uh, uh, community all these years. And it couldn't have happened without the hard work and dedication of many people in this room. Next. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Philippe Azan from the French Embassy and also the Space, uh, the French Space Agency. Um, well, I can notice that users' needs are international. The ch climate change is global. The cost constraints are both on both sides of Atlantic. So, of course, I will support international cooperation. But beyond the use of data. National cooperation could be understood maybe, and that's my question, by uh, the using all the assets. As Michael said, for example, Sentinel-2 will be ready to be used within a few years. I understood, Sarah, that this mission won't be covering all the needs, but uh, nearly 80% of the needs. So the, on a short-term short point of view, we can imagine using this 80% of the mission and complete by small sp spacecraft pre-flyer for other mission as thermal data. And that on the long-term point of view, could we imagine, as we did for water, a L train, a long train, using uh, JAXA assets, ESA assets, NASA assets, and so on? Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, so Flip, you're, you're absolutely uh, correct, and, and that is uh, precisely in line uh, with uh, with the ideas uh, that we have. Uh, we've explored internationally uh, for many years and demonstrated uh, the ability to fly an international constellation of missions whose capability is far greater than uh, any of the individual missions together. Uh, we have been working uh, very, very hard uh, with you and other international partners to assure that if we fly the missions, the data are freely and openly uh, available for combined, uh, for combined products. Being able to supplement one nation's mission with additional bands, as you pointed out, thermal infrared on, uh, on a separate spacecraft uh, in close formation, perhaps uh, with Sentinel-2, uh, is precisely along the lines that uh, we're thinking and that we're hoping that you are thinking uh, as well. So we appreciate your offer. I think I'll just add that. <laughs> 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 I 
given, <laughs> given, our, <laughs> given our commitment to free and open data, we applaud the European decision recently to move forward with a free and open uh, data policy for Copernicus and are very excited to, um, to continue that relationship and continue work on the technical and the policy aspects together. And this is the right kind of step to take and we need to take similar steps with the rest of the international community that flies Earth observing satellites. Thank you. We uh, stay international. Micheline Tabash, European Space Agency uh, representative in, in Washington. Um, Sarah, yes, we also applaud, but we wait a little bit. There are two more steps before the... <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, I'm managing the expectations here. Um, also, just to make sure I've understood correctly, of course uh, you welcome collaboration, etc., etc., as we do. But... Um, would, if uh, European industry were to respond to the RFI, would you consider that? Yes. He said, say yes. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, if, since I have a mic, one last question. You mentioned the steering committee. I'm not quite sure what the role, who is that steering committee and what they should be doing. Um, back when we got this uh, budget direction in the President's budget, NASA and USGS moved out and set up uh, what we refer to as the steering committee. It's a joint committee between uh, NASA and USGS. It consists of, uh, what, six to, ten, six to ten people uh, from both agencies, and we've been planning. I, I chair that committee. And we are, have been planning and, and figuring out where to go from here, what tasks we need to study and scoping out that study as well as working on the, the agreement, the official agreement between NASA and USGS, an MOU if you will, uh, to do this entire program. And the answer Mike said was yes, we are definitely interested in international collaboration and efforts of that sort. And, and just to follow up too, we, as Mike said, we've been working with ESA and with, with, with the A-Train for some time with the A-Train constellation, which includes JAXA, Kness missions, together with NASA missions, and looking at the Sentinel um, sort of as the backbone of several different constellations, one particular being the Sentinel one, looking at all the data integration issues, the simultaneity issues, how you operate the missions. And it's, so there's been a fair amount of work in, um, over the past two years come in right now, and it's, we expect that to go forward. That's an active part of this entire discussion um, planning activity. <coughs> But we are also sensitive to not clap after the first movement. <laughs> Go ahead. That's Mike to the gentleman in the middle here, please. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Marley, Harris Corporation. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the technical aspects of the program. Are you also interested in uh, feedback on potential business model aspects of the program? and particularly the relationships between, uh, between the government and the private sector, clearly not all the way to, or perhaps not all the way to the commercialization which we've looked at before, but with regard to sort of uh, interim opportunities like public-private partnerships, sharing of assets and cost recovery and those sorts of things. Uh, the short answer is yes. I'm glad you brought that up. It was not something we specifically spelled out in the RFI, but it was pointed out in a recent uh, NRC report that uh, uh, we should do things, we need to do things differently in the future in order to contain costs moving forward. Uh, so yes, we, we would entertain uh, new business models and that is something we would, we, we were going to take on internally uh, farther down the line, but thank you for bringing that up. As we consider new business models, uh, compromises, as we've talked about in, in every aspect, the free and open availability of a substantial portion of the data uh, for research use is a pillar of the U.S. government's uh, position for all Earth observation uh, civil data. And uh, so the models obviously have to uh, accommodate that at some level. 
I'll just add to that that given the number of operational uses of Landsat these days, um, there isn't a lot of room for a fee per image or even per pixel model these days. We have demand for a free and open data policy on the research and operational sides of the program. And as I said, that is the USGS position on our earth science data. <laughs> These data are too important to the nation to make them limitedly available. The opportunities, however, for the middle, the middle uh, where, if you will, of new and innovative information products based on these measurements uh, that can be sold uh, is certainly there. Down in front here, somebody bring um, him the mic. One comment as he's bringing the microphone related to the procurement of, ex of commercially available imagery products, the buy once, use many time approach is something that we would certainly consider from an economic value point of view. It's the, it's the limited restrictions on the, on the image once you buy it that we, we doesn't, is not consistent with our free and open policy. But if we can buy the same imagery and use it the way we normally do, we'd be happy to do that. But that's, that's the, that just has to fit into our usage policy. Um, but we'll take it any way we can get it. So. Okay, uh, Daryl Williams from Global Science and Technology. I have, I guess, a two-phase question associated with cost and budget. There's been several references to the President's FY14 budget and the NASA line item, which was land imaging, but not Landsat imaging, but it was, I think, $30 million for next year. And then I think it was either in Space News or somewhere else, there was a topic that there was going to be $20 million in FY14 set aside for studies. Now, I also got Dave's last comment that there's no funding for this RFI, but you know, some of us have been incurring quite a bit of expense, both in responding to the USGS RFI and to the Earth Venture proposals before that. So I'm just wondering, you know, is there any chance of any funding at some point after this initial solicitation? That you, because the quality of what you're going to get is, is somewhat dependent on the amount of time and effort that can be can be placed on it. So I'm just curious what happened with the promise of maybe 20 million dollars being competed com, com, competed within the community. Um, will we do funded studies? Probably yes. Um, when What exactly they're going to be, I don't think we can say at this point. This RFI is open to get the maximum input, uh, but understanding that we're not paying for it, so the, the quality will be what we you get what you pay for to a degree. But we, yes, we fully expect this $20 million is not going to be just for internal NASA money and spent on our own things. It's, it's open to how we use it to address the question, the ch challenges we have, and that could very well mean some funded studies with, um, with to a broader audience. Any so other? let me assume that if, the, if there's a no, mid-August due date next year, that that's before the end of fiscal year 14, that perhaps when things become knowledgeable at that time, there might be some contracts let or competed at the end of fiscal year 14? I think that's a possibility. I wouldn't rule it out, certainly. Okay. Then the other question that was more due to with cost is you want a cost estimate for what we're submitting, but is, are there going to be good details as to whether it's a loaded cost with NASA's oversight or the cost that the industry feels they could do it with, with, uh, without a whole lot of help. All right, Dave says you take that one, Steve. <laughs> um, you, the, the, the submissions for the RFI, your responses should include your assumptions on what they're based on. If, they, if there's a no oversight, you know, and there's always the government oversight versus or not, if there's a no oversight as assumption, that should be just put in there as an assumption and very clearly stated is all. We're open to all ideas, but... Um, we eventually will have to come up with a program which assesses their overall risk. And risk from a government point of view means the amount of government insight that we have into it. It doesn't mean we reject the idea of no insight. It means we have to assess the risk that comes along with that. Did we get any questions from the... Uh, nobody dialing in. Okay. Um, any other questions from the floor? Jennifer Turner Valley of Bell Aerospace. So um, I'll, I'll follow up on Daryl's line of questioning. Uh, Dave, you pointed out that you wanted RFI responses that are publicly available, non-proprietary information. Does that also extend to the cost portion of the information that we'll be providing in the RFI? Because I, we, I would hate to drive our company out of business by telling all of our competition exactly what it will cost us to do the best job for you guys. <laughs> The way we phrased it in the RFI, let's see how did we phrase that. 
<laughs> no, the, in, the intent was not to disclose the cost information for that very reason. I, thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> But that would it, it would it, the cost information will inform us as to the reasonableness of, of the concept. And I, I, following up on the cost comment, one of the critical parameters when we deliver the results of this study and the plan for the land imaging program into the future next August, it will include a very comprehensive assessment of the probable cost. And it's not just going to be sub what was submitted to us, et cetera. It will be our own internal assessments. We have a lot of approach. We have a very well-defined process within NASA. USGS, I imagine, has the same. I'm not as familiar with it. But how you estimate the cost for a program five, ten years down the road, we will have to do that. So the package will not be a wag. It will be a fairly detailed assessment of what it will cost and what the cost risks are in the implementation of the program that we put together. So we will do our own follow-up assessment of the cost um, that the government's cost will be at the end when we finish this and we submit it to our sponsors for evaluation. Just, just to, to expand a little bit on the RFI inputs, um, the reason we put in uh, no proprietary information to be submitted is we want to be able to use that amongst the architecture team freely and build an architecture based on the various inputs, uh, whereas if things are marked proprietary, it really ties our hands with what we can do but we, we do not intend to publish or, or post individual responses to the RFI. Those will be kept internal to, to NASA and USGS. But we, we want to be able to use that information freely to build a comprehensive architecture or set of architectures going forward. Uh, Daryl Williams, Global Science and Technology. I guess this is a question for Sarah and, and USGS. Well, one of the frustrations from partic participating in the USGS RFI, and I guess it's maybe because there was proprietary information in there, but we never got any feedback. And so I guess I would like to ask the, R uh, the USGS folks to maybe get back to those who submitted the RFI last time. If we submitted something that was totally considered off the wall and, and not a good idea, we'd at least like to know that so we don't waste our time and effort in going forward. So I, I don't think it's asking for a, a, an extensive debrief. It's just asking, like, yeah, you got a green light or a yellow light to go ahead and proceed, or you were really our, – our review thought you really missed the mark and you shouldn't really bother. I, I, it would be helpful. Thank you. So you're not asking for any public disclosure of specific responses. You're asking for um, an interview with us about our assessment of the response. Yeah. Um, I think we can do some of that, um, but we'll, um, we'll have to be careful to give people equal treatment. And so I'll, I'll take that back and check with our folks in the technical program and in legal, and we'll get back to you. And please bear in mind as well what Mike Farlick said a little while earlier. There are differences between this request for information and the USGS one. There's a lot of overlap for sure, but look at the request that we're asking for um, and, and partially in your, in your decision to respond or not. Please. Bob Leroy again from Lockheed Martin. I appreciate your question there, Daryl. Uh, but the follow-up is I think I heard two things that might affect our RFI response. One was a desire to get uh, data uh, in 2018. And then, Mike, you backed off a little and said, you know, there's other ways to get data. So an RFI response, are you looking for a solution? Because it's going to affect our answers. Uh, are you looking for a solution for 2018 and long term? Uh, is that a priority? Clearly, what you heard was that uh, there is tremendous value in a more or less continuous data set and more or less is what we have had for the last uh, uh, for the last 41 years. Uh, the, we are sensitive to that, uh, as you heard from uh, Peter Callahan and everybody else. Uh, so, uh, on the uh, on the other hand, uh, there is no dropping off the cliff in 2018 that is available. You know that we can see right now. Like there's a timer that's going to go off in Landsat 8 and it will stop operating uh, or something like that. 
So in fact, this whole long-term system is a balancing of the various uh, factors, one of which is uh, continuity and gap risk. Uh, so 2018 uh, was the, the year based strictly on the, uh, on the design lifetime of Landsat 8, as I understand it. 2018 was the year that the administration identified for us to start the 20-year clock on the study. We know that there are mitigations that are out there. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so I, I'm, a, I'm a bit surprised that you, that you say that it will be a, a tremendous difference in your response. Well, uh, I mean, response. as I asked before, when you, when you run a clock, if your study isn't done until the end of or August of 2014, it's going to take you six months to a year to get an acquisition out. That's three years to get a satellite up. That's if that's the response for 2018. Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily have to be the response. But that, that's for what I'm asking, though. Is that what you're asking us to provide? A way of getting to 2018? Or are you going to worry, the government is going to worry about other mitigation uh, approaches? In the end, we are, we in the government are attempting to come up with a sustained program. So if responses don't address the sort of near-term 2018 to 2021 time frame or something, we're going to have to do that for, uh, for the nation. We're going to have to come up with appropriate responses and mitigations for the nation to the extent that you have good ideas along those lines or to the extent that you are – and to the extent that you are sensitive to – our need nationally uh, for that and internationally for that uh, and the phasing for your idea, whatever it is, is sensitive to that need, then your idea will be, uh, will be uh, viewed perhaps more favorably. Even if it cuts in in 2022 but leaves space in the 2015 uh, to 2020 time frame. See what I mean? Yeah, I'll just add to that that the um, the 2018 time frame is quick, and that's why I said um, we feel that we have a few months to assess a near-term solution, and even then, it is very quick. So, in practical terms, this is one of the reasons that the RFI that you'll see later today um, asks for partial solutions and. Um, isn't, isn't as strict as it could be. If you want to put forward a solution that isn't available January 1st, 2018, but is shortly thereafter, or something that, pending what we have in 2018, could be the, good, the right next solution, then those are welcome. We have a real near-term concern um, based on Landsat 7, um, but we understand completely that it takes time to develop good, reliable systems. So we're, we're in a time crunch right now, and yes, we are going to continue pushing on that earlier date because, if possible, um, we feel that that mitigates the, the risk of a serious data gap, but you know, we have to be realistic here, and that's why the RFI is as loose as it is. I haven't said much, but what I'd like to say is that we'd, we'd like you to join us in thinking about the whole problem. So thank so and we expect and hope that this RFI process will illuminate the whole problem, uh, not just um, the next spacecraft or the next suite of instruments. Uh, and so uh, that's why you hear basically a lockstep viewpoint that your knowledge from industry uh, goes beyond just the production of the next system, but really to a comprehensive view of how the nation should address the question. So we welcome that very broad view as well as helping us understand how we might mitigate a uh, gap in the near term in that context of the broader view. We're asking you for a lot, but we're really confident that you're up to the challenge.
Thanks, Laura Stewart again from Draper Labs. I wanted to ma ask for a brief clarification about something you said, Sarah, because I think it's incredibly important for the for public-private partnership models. You you talked about now 50% of the users are operational for Landsat data, so or somewhere near that. And so to me, that means timeliness is critical. One model is government gets latent data, the paid users get the real time. The, and there's, but there's other models. But if operational is important, then that's not a very good model, for example. Well, that is one of the striking findings from our um, our study last year, and we're continuing to do a much more detailed study on our users and requirements, and so I hope we can validate that with a great deal more detail, um, but we don't have it for you today. So what we have now is um, we've identified far more operational uses and real-time uses of the data than we had previously known about, and some of those are very well established. So yes, we we are going to have to be very thoughtful about um, about the business model and about which parts of the user base um, benefit from which user, um, which business models. That's that's very good information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, in the back, question. Hi, I'm Ken Aslam uh, from ICS. Uh, I've been involved on and off with the Landsat program. Um, but my real question is I do understand what NASA is desiring, sort of like a, you know, an architecture or preliminary architecture. But what I'm trying to understand is what are the real incentives for the industry to provide you the detail which you're looking for and what their return and investment would be? in providing those details because providing cer certain details, you may get a, a cost to estimate as a one line item, but if they don't provide you enough detail on the cost line item, uh, uh, how would you really assess the cost of different systems, of systems or components of your architecture for integrating it on your side? Uh, and the second part of the question, what really prohibits you from and prohibits NASA from going out to the industry who are the implementers of these kind of solutions and providing architectures uh, for letting them do the phase A and B studies and giving you different solutions and then you guys integrate it on your side saying, hey, this is really what we want based on the different studies done for us. I guess the answer to the first question, you know, what, what uh, incentive is it for you to help us is, is really along the lines of, of we have ideas of our own of what we think should go forward, but we know there are other ideas out there. And uh, we, one, we want to make sure we don't overlook anything. And the other thing is that when we're all said and done, we will have an architecture in place incorporating the ideas that we have seen where we feel that they are, are feasible and fit within within the constraints that we have to work with and, and meet the goals, meet the objectives we need to meet with this architecture. So if we don't have your idea, we will never assess your idea and if it shows up in the architecture, uh, it will just be by luck, not something that, that we actually had, a, had the opportunity to assess that idea. As far as one-line cost estimates, we'll be able to see through that fairly quickly. We have uh, significant cost modeling capabilities both at the agency and we have ways to get uh, that expertise as well to come in and supplement where we need it. Uh, what prohibits NASA from going out uh, for phase A, B studies uh, has a lot to do with the budget that we have laid out ahead of us in the near term. Uh, our budget ramps up to a steady state, but in the near term, it's it's lower. And as uh, Sarah pointed out, uh, we cannot wait around and do extensive amounts of studies. Uh, we need to complete this study and move on and start implementing the architecture in uh, uh, early 20, 2015 time frame.
just want to perhaps clarify or provide some context. When uh, the administration came to USGS and NASA, the agencies, uh, it was with a reasonably clear direction to provide that, that it's the agencies that have the responsibility of providing for the nation a sustained land and a sustainable land imaging system. Uh, I don't believe that I'm uh, going off the reservation to say that uh, uh, there is, uh, it is not our direction to solicit and select a single industry solution, you know, as the process. Okay. There, there will be solicitations, undoubtedly. There will be selections, undoubtedly. But the going in process is that it is up to the agencies. It is our responsibility to present back to the administration and ultimately to Congress about why and how the design of the system that we are proposing uh, satisfies the nation's needs. I think I'll go back to where Dave Jarrett started this um, this tripartite response and say that from the ground system perspective, um, as I said earlier, we are genuinely interested in your vision of where ground systems can go. And we have, we have questions on the table internally, as Dave described, that NASA has questions on the table internally on the space system side. We are asking ourselves, are we as the Earth observations community moving away from scenes and toward pixels, whether we're moving away from bands to spectra, um, whether radio frequency downlinks are on their way out, we're going toward laser communications, et cetera. We have a lot of questions about, um, about end user data processing and where the algorithms live. We have a lot of questions on directions for the ground system and how we serve our users. So these are the kinds of ideas that we are tossing around internally about the future. And you can inform us about where you think these ideas are going and where, where we ought to be putting our money for future ground systems. And I think what Dave is saying is that they are in exactly the same place on the space system side. Plenty of ideas, but need more input. And from the from the space flight, um, space borne acquisition point of view, we, we also are looking at, we've been evolving our approach from a single government solution, build a big satellite in-house or with some competed elements, but largely in-house to, to a more distributed architecture where we now look at hosted payloads. We look at um, buying access to space in different ways. And when we think we're looking at a solution that's going to be in place 15, 20 years, 25 years down the road, we definitely think there's a, a wide range of possible alternate futures from just building it the way we built it before to how we want to do it in the future. And, and knowing, even if I'm not going to do a new a, a, a public-private partnership in 2020, knowing that I want to be ready to do it in 25 or in 30, I need to do some of the initial work in 15 and in 18 and 19 to be ready for that possible future. So I don't have the same question 10 years from now, which says I haven't done it before, so I'm not going to do it now. So I need to design a system that evolves to a different future. And I need input. We need input from the from the industry side that says we could provide these capacities, these capabilities under a different structure if, we, if we're ready to do that in, in some period down the road. That gets back to the point we're looking not for a next, a next solution but a gen next generation solution for 25 years. And it will evolve over time and we need to be able to evolve wi with time and not just truncated evolution where we just jump from one state to another 10 years from now. So I really think there is potential for starting things now that will lead to a big change 15, 10 years from now. But we need to know that now, what, what is our end state going to be or what are the possible end states so we can do that initial work now. And there's a, there's a payoff at the end potentially for industry to be part of that helping us design or define that new trajectory that we want to go to. In the back here? Raise your hand so get a mic. Thank you. Uh, I'm Robert Rose with the Wildlife Conservation Society. It sounds like this RFI is more for you to get input from technology partners. And I'm curious if there's going to be a point of input from end users and, and people who are going to be using this or, or the results of this on the ground. 
<laughs> yes, absolutely. The USGS has been studying our users and, um, and what they're using the data for for several years now. And we have a requirements analysis started up. Um, we are systematically surveying users. As I think Dave's slides showed earlier, we will be holding at least one user's workshop. And yes, in short, we need, we need exactly um, that kind of input. Because as I said earlier, the number of applications of Landsat data has exploded. And we need, we need input on what they are and speci specifically how operational these uses are, where is the division between the research community and the operations community, um, what, kinds of, um, what kinds of areas you use Landsat for, um, where you have hard requirements and where you're more on the, um, the you know, where you know what would be helpful to you in the future. Yeah, we have all of those questions for users and we have a structured elicitation um, that we are putting users through, um, through a fair amount of interviewing and dialogue to elicit that kind of information. So leave your card, please. Stan Schneider's still retired. Um, <laughs> so uh, I guess I could wait till 4.30 to find out, but is, are you going to reference in the RFI the recent NRC report and how should responders treat it? It looks like it kind of parallels your presentation today. It, it very clearly parallels uh, what our thought process has been uh, over the last, you know, geez, where are we? Last six months or so. Um, so uh, the intent is to post it on the website, but uh, we have been having difficulty actually getting a copy of uh, a digital copy of that report. And we go online, you say you can purchase it, but. Uh, <laughs> we intend to find a way to be able to post that, I guess, but uh, we'll leave that up to Sarah to figure out how to get, get the report they sanctioned. <laughs> you know, you only had to ask. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Right here again, Daryl. Uh, Daryl Williams, Global Science and Technology. I don't know if this is as much of a question, but I'll provide some information that will up the ante or the anxiety level a little bit. Going back to the user uh, comment back here, uh, Sam Goward, University of Maryland, and I are just wrapping up a detailed 10-year uh, study of daily cloud cover using MODIS data from the East Coast all the way out through the Indiana Corn Belt. And the statistics kind of come out like this. With a 16-day repeat visit, which we have with one Landsat, you can pretty much assure yourself of being able to cobble together one cloud-free image of an area per year. If you have two, two satellites in orbit with an eight-day repeat, you can roughly put together a seasonal component. If you want to do a monthly cloud-free mosaic of a given area, you need four-day coverage. Uh, Two-day coverage will give you roughly bi-weekly capability to cobble something together. And daily coverage will yield a, weekly, a high probability of cobbling together a weekly cloud-free image. And I know that's what the ag community wants. So uh, I know well, we've been so f concentrated on the fact that admission's a billion dollars, we can only get one at a time, but we need to come up with some innovative solutions because to really answer the mail, you really need to get a modus like capability, but at Landsat resolution. So that's the challenge, and to do it within the budgets. The statistics back it up. more questions from the audience or online? Nobody online, okay. <coughs> well, um, I, with that then, if there are no further questions, uh, I think we'll call this meeting to, a, to, a, to an end. Thank you for attending and um, 45 minutes from now, 50 minutes from now, the RFI will be posted. And um, any final comments from the panel here before? I just wanted to thank, uh, thank everybody in the audience and, and also uh, Kathy Carroll for uh, three miles of running with the microphone. Thank you all.